Great, so this is going to be a taste of rock. I'm Richard Feldman. All right, so a uh, quick bit of background, if you, if you haven't heard of Rock before, uh, this is a, a language for making delightful software, is our tagline. Um, you can learn more about it at rocklang.org, although right now it's a very bare bones website. Um, so like Becca said, uh, I gave a talk at Philly ETE this year, uh, about five months ago. Um, basically, th the talk was not about Rock, but it included sort of an introduction to Rock uh, and some of the really novel things about it, um, specifically this concept of applications and platforms. Since we've got about an hour today, I'm not going to sort of rehash all the stuff that I talked about in that talk. But don't worry if you haven't seen the talk, because uh, most of the stuff that we're going to talk about here has nothing to do with that. It's just going to be sort of the, a different part of the language. Um, and so you know, you're, you're not going to get lost uh, you know, if you haven't seen it. But I do recommend going and looking at it uh, if, if you haven't seen it, because a lot of the stuff that I'm going to sort of uh, gloss over is covered in a lot more depth um, in that talk. OK. So, an outline of what we're going to talk about today. Um, so, we're going to start with just a brief language intro. So, talk about like syntax, just you know, basic sort of language fundamentals, so you get an idea of like how to read rock code. Um, then we're going to do some demos. Um, then we're going to talk about sort of the, the progress of the language, like like how far we've come uh, so far, and like some of the future goals. Because uh, full disclosure, this is a language that's very, very much a work in progress. Um, like we've been working on it since 2018. Um, it's come a long way. It can do a lot of cool stuff, uh, but it's definitely not ready for like prime time. You know, go out and use it in production type of situation. Um, then, of course, at the end, uh, we'll have some time for questions. All right. So let's start with the, the sort of language intro, starting with the primitive values. So Rock has six basic primitive values. Um, so we've got functions, numbers, and strings. Those are sort of like scalar values. Like you know, you just have one thing going on inside of them. And then you have some collection primitives uh, that are, are collections of uh, combinations of these or of other collections. So those are lists, records, and tags. So basically, I'm just going to talk through how all these work. Um, starting with everyone's favorite example, hello world. Uh, so this is an example of doing hello world in rock. Say main equals standard out dot line, hello world. I'm um, going to call out a couple of things here. Uh, ordinarily, as we'll see later, there would actually be some more code above this, just like sort of the, the module intro. Um, I'm leaving that out because this is sort of a beginner introduction, but we'll come back to it later. A uh, couple of things to note here. Um, so first of all, we're calling standard out dot line. And the way that we're calling this function is with a space, not with parentheses. So in Rock, you do not need parentheses to call a function. It's just having that space in there or a new line or something like that uh, is just how you call functions. Um, standard out is the name of a module here. So there's the line function inside the standard out module. That's how we're sort of like, we call this a fully qualified uh, function name. I could also import the standard out uh, module and say, I want to import the line function as unqualified, in which case I wouldn't have to put standard out dot. But it's kind of a convention in Rock to typically fully qualify things unless you have a reason not to. And we'll show an example of that later too. OK, here's a comment. Uh, comments in Rock are with uh, hash signs. So just say, hey, print hello world to standard out. Pretty straightforward. Um, here's a little bit more of an uh, advanced way to, to do hello world. So uh, again, we've got the standard out dot line. But here, I've actually defined greeting, which is a separate string that I've defined sort of at the top level of the module um, alongside main. And I said greeting equals hello. And then here, I'm doing string interpolation, where th that's what this backslash and parentheses mean. And basically, inside these parentheses, after I do the backslash, I can put the name of anything else that's in currently in scope. And Rock will just, at runtime, substitute whatever that value happens to be in there. A um, couple of notes about this. So one is that you can define anything you want at the top level just like this. Um, these are all constants. So everything in Rock is essentially a constant and immutable. So I cannot go back and mutate this. This is not a global mutable variable or anything like that. It's a lot more like a constant. And also, all these strings are immutable. All the lists we're going to see later are immutable. Numbers are immutable. Records are immutable. Everything's immutable. Um, and everything's a constant. Uh, so uh, this is going to be <laughs> lots of functional programming. Um, so basically, uh, one other thing to note is that because of that, uh, because Rock is a pure functional programming language, um, order of declarations like this, like with equals, does not matter. So you actually might notice that I've defined greeting after I'm using it. Like I'm using greeting up here in main, but I'm defining it later. You can do that with any, any of these declarations. Like any of the e anything that's using equals to, to define it, you can shuffle them up and it doesn't matter. The compiler will just figure out. OK, um, here's another way to write this. So previously, I had greeting at the top level. Uh, but here, I've actually indented greeting. And uh, that actually has meaning in Rock. So when you do an indentation like this, this is basically defining a new scope. So I'm essentially saying right here, this greeting declaration, much like I had in the previous slide, um, is only going to be in scope for this block right here. So everything at this indentation level is now going to contain greeting, but everything outside of it no longer contains it. So main still has access to this uh, greeting. Like everything inside main has access to this greeting value, but everything outside of main does not have access. And if I tried to access greeting out there, it would no longer compile. 
Um, here's an example of defining a function. So I've made a function called greet, takes one argument called greeting, again, standard out dot line, string interpolation with greeting, and then here in main, I'm just calling greet hello. As with all other types of values, the order doesn't matter. Like I'm able to call this function before I've defined it you know, later on in the file. Um, incidentally, if you're wondering, <laughs> the reason that functions start with a backslash is it's supposed to be sort of kind of if you squint, looks like a lambda symbol, because um, colloquially, a, a common term for uh, anonymous functions is a lambda. Um, I know a lot of programming languages have different syntaxes for defining functions. Like there's a couple different ways to do it. In Rock, there's just one way to do it. This is how you define a function. All functions are created exactly the same way in exactly this way, uh, with equals and then a, a backslash. Okay. So I'm going to fade out the main part for a little bit and just kind of focus on uh, this greet function. Let's, let's play around with this and uh, see some other language features while we're uh, messing around with it. Um, so here I'm going to introduce a conditional. So basically I'm going to say, OK, let's, let's keep this standard out dot line greeting like we had before. But if the greeting string is empty, instead I'm just going to print out hi. So this is an if conditional. So we have if then else. Um, again, no need for parentheses around this. Uh, it's just sort of bounded by the if and the then keywords. Um, as you might imagine, uh, stir.isEmpty is a function where you call it, you give it a string, and then it gives you back a Boolean, true or false, you know, was the string actually empty? So if greeting was an empty string, then we're going to print out hi, otherwise we'll say the greeting and then world. Um, here's another way we could do that, because we had previously, we're calling standardout.line twice, so maybe if we wanted to refactor that out, um, we could say stir equals, and then do our whole if expression like before, but you notice that now I don't have this stood out dot line uh, calls in both of these branches. Instead, I've just moved it out to the top, standard out dot line, stir, and then uh, this is just equal to this entire if then else. So, uh, you know, some languages you may have a, a difference here where like there, uh, if, um, if is a statement and then there's a ternary operator uh, if you want to turn it into an expression. In Rock, uh, it's just an expression. So if you can just assign whatever you want equal to if and uh, it's just going to, you know, put this string into stir uh, or that string depending on this conditional. Okay, let's, uh, let's start with this string literal hi, and then let's uh, mess around with it a little bit to see uh, some other language features. Um, so here's another way we could represent hi, is calling stir.join, passing a list, so this is uh, the first time we're seeing a list of um, three smaller strings, so h, i, and exclamation point. That's a totally valid way to do that. These two are, you know, they're going to do exactly the same thing, because uh, stir.join just takes a list of strings and joins them all together. Um, uh, so, you know, this, this comment is letting us know, yeah, hey, it's, uh, it's hi. Um, Another way we could do this, though, is that we could do a, a pipeline operator. So the pipeline operator is basically just a way to call functions uh, in a different sort of syntax. So this line right here, where I'm doing the, the list hi exclamation point and then piping it to stir.join, is exactly the same as this. And when I say exactly the same, I don't just mean like they do the same thing. They have the same runtime performance. This is actually just syntax sugar for this. So uh, usually if I were writing something like this, if I were just going to have a pipe of one value, I probably would not bother to, to use a pipeline operator. Where it gets nice is when you have like multiple functions uh, being called in a row uh, with the output of one being the input to the next one. So let's look at an example of that. So here I've got hi exclamation point and I'm joining those together. Well here's another way I could equivalently do that, that I could do hi and then pipe that to list.append exclamation point and then pipe that to stir.join. Again, this is going to do exactly the same thing. So we're going to start with this list of h and i, and then we're going to append an exclamation point onto that list with list.append, and then I'm going to pipe that to stir.join to join them all together just like before. Um, so the, the, the desugared version of that would use parentheses to, to nest the function calls like this. So list.append, h, i, and then the exclamation point, and then we've got parentheses around all that, and then we're passing that to stir.join. Worth noting, because I know this is a, a common beginner mistake I've seen in similar languages like Elm, uh, Rock is a direct descendant of the Elm programming language, um, is uh, that when you're starting out, you might think, oh, like uh, the parentheses are in the wrong place here. They should go, like they should be touching the function, because in a lot of languages, that's the syntax, is uh, touching the, the, the function that you're calling. But in Rock, that's, that's really not how it works. It's really more like, we're sort of using them more like how you use them in like a, a arithmetic expression. Um, we're just using the parentheses to sort of disambiguate hey, uh, this list.append call, this is all one thing, and then the result of that whole thing is being passed to stir.join. But again, if we're doing it in the pipeline style, you know, uh, we don't need any parentheses for that. We can just kind of uh, keep piping them. And in fact, if we want, we could throw a third pipe in there and just say list of just h, pipe in list.append i, pipe in list.append exclamation point, and then stir.join that whole thing. Um, so this is sort of like the, the type of thing that people like the pipeline operator for, is when you have like quite a, a number of um, operations to run in sequence, uh, like sort of like a data pipeline, um, and you want to just do them uh, one at a time. Um, one more thing to note about this is that uh, list.append right here is receiving as its first argument the step from the previous pipe. 
So this h is going in as the first argument to list out append i, and then the, that returns its result, and then uh, that result gets passed as the first argument to list out append here, and sir.join just has one argument, so we're just passing that into there. So again, this is lots of ways to say hi exclamation point. Um, one last way is uh, with list.concat. Uh, so list.append adds one string onto the end of something. List.concat takes a list of strings and another list of strings and concatenates the two lists together. So again, this is totally equivalent to, to what we had before. Okay, so putting all that together, we have uh, lots of different ways to see this, uh, <laughs> this string literal high. All right, um, here's uh, how we can add a second argument to our function. So I've just added uh, the audience argument and then now when I call greet, I'm passing hello and world. Uh, now that I have this ar audience argument passed in, I can use it in string interpolation in here. Um, this you know, works about the, way, the same way that you would expect in a lot of languages. Uh, of note, if you're used to um, pure functional languages like Elm and stuff like that, um, Rock is not a curried language. Uh, lots of other languages in this family are, but Rock is not. So uh, this, if you're not used to currying, don't worry, there's nothing to learn. <laughs> it just works the same way you're used to. Um, Another way we could do this uh, is instead of passing in two arguments, hello and world, I could actually pass in a record of arguments. So here's how that looks. Um, so records uh, have curly braces and then they have field names and values associated with them. So here I have a record where there's a field named greeting and a field named audience. Both of those happen to be strings. Um, they could be you know, whatever I want, they don't have to be strings. Uh, records work with any different kind of type you want. Um, and now I've named my one argument an info, which is uh, the name I've chosen for this record. And inside the string interpolation, I'm doing um, info.greeting and info.audience. So that's sort of how all three of these connect. Record gets passed in. Now I have this info argument, and I can just say info.greeting, info.audience. And, um, and it, again, it will print exactly the same thing as before. Okay, one last uh, way to, to sort of do the same thing is we can do record destructuring. So previously I had uh, one record named info. Um, I'm still passing a record in, but now I'm doing what's called destructuring to sort of pull that record apart and say, I actually don't care about the record as a whole, so I'm not gonna bother naming it info. All I really care about are these two fields, greeting and audience, and so I'm just gonna name them like that. And this is, again, equivalent to what we had before, except now I have a value in scope named greeting, which I can use directly in string interpolation, and same thing with audience, uh, which is used right there. Um, if you want, you don't have to destructure every single field like I did here, like maybe there are 10 more fields in here. This code would still work. It's just like, uh, these are the two that I care about, everything else, just ignore it. Um, and yeah, well, it works exactly the same way. Okay. Um, so let's talk about types a little bit. Um, so far I haven't put any type annotations on anything so far, um, and that's because uh, it's not necessary in Rock. Uh, so Rock has not only a sound type system, um, like if you're used to TypeScript or something, you may have heard it doesn't have a sound type system uh, you know, by design. Rock does. Uh, it's an intentionally sound type system. Um, it has complete type inference, meaning that uh, you never have to write a type annotation if you don't want to. Um, you can use the whole language, just write everything like we've been doing all these slides. Uh, it's never necessary. Um, and also, uh, the type inference is never, never gets it wrong. Um, so type inference always correctly infers the most general type that it possibly could for the code that you've written. Um, it'll never make a mistake on that. Now granted, there may be bugs in the implementation, <laughs> but at least in the design, there's a whole family of languages where this is true, um, and Rock is one of them. Um, also, uh, Rock does not have uh, try-catch. That's like just not a thing in the language. Um, instead, we use error unions to do error handling, and I'm a big fan of them, and I'm excited to de demo them a little bit later in the, uh, in the talk. Okay, so um, having said that, although you don't need type annotations, you can optionally add them, so let's talk about them a little bit. Um, so here is an example of a type annotation. This is a type that says, I have a thing called name, and name has the type str, which is to say a string. Um, so uh, the way that you annotate something is you just add it right above the declaration itself. So if I had this name equals quote rock, um, I would add a type annotation optionally on top of it by saying name colon stir. Um, you can, if you want, you can just have a uh, standalone annotation. Like I can just say names colon list stir, which is to say there's a thing called names, but I haven't provided an implementation yet. Um, basically, this is just for if you're sort of prototyping something, you can just write out the types of things and Rock will generate a dummy implementation that just, if you ever use it, it crashes. <laughs> uh, so this is just like if you're, if you're trying to sort of like fiddle around with like an API and just tr try to like get things working, you don't want to bother adding an implementation yet, you can just write the annotation on its own and that will work. Um, of course, uh, well, <laughs> work for definitions of, you know, <laughs> if you run it, it'll crash. Um, but, you know, that's again by design. Um, and of course, you know, you can always uh, add a, a definition to it later. Like here's the actual implementation. Um, this, by the way, is a list of strings. Um, so lists have a type parameter, which means that you can't just say, I've got a list. There could be anything in there. Um, you have to say a list of what? 
Like you have to say what the element type is when you're de defining a list. Um, and, uh, and every element in the list has to have that type. It has to like line up with that. So there's a lot of languages where this is true. Rock is one of them. So you cannot, for example, have a mix of strings and numbers in the same list. That's not allowed. OK. Um, here's what a function type looks like. So this is that um, uh, stir.concat function. Um, it's basically like take two strings, concatenate them together. It's very similar to list.concat like we saw earlier. Um, so the arguments are separated by commas. And then at the very end, there's a little arrow that uh, re refers to the return type. So this is saying uh, this is a function that takes two strings as arguments and then returns a string as the uh, return type. Um, here's the actual list.append. Um, so here we can see an example of a type variable. So because list has this type parameter that uh, has to be speci specified, like what is the element type, um, if you want to write a sort of generic function that works on all different types of lists, uh, this is how you do it. You use a lowercase, so you might have noticed that uh, all the types so far that we've seen have been uppercase. That's because lowercase type names are refer to type variables. And essentially what this means here is like, I have a list of elums. Um, I chose the name elum, but this is like a variable name. I could have also said, instead of elum, I could say x. But if I said x here, I would also have to say x here and x here. And basically this is sort of describing a relationship between the arguments and the return type. I'm saying that I have a list of whatevers, and whatever that type is, you've got to give me one more of those as the second argument, and also I'm going to give you back a list of whatevers. So whatever this elum type is, whether it's a string, or a number, or a boolean, or whatever it is, um, you have to give me a list of those, and then one more of whatever those are, and then I will give you back a list of the same type that you gave me in. So it's sort of a way of connecting all these different types, um, and then this is a function that works on you know, any, any different flavor of list you have. You could also, if you wanted to, have a function that's more specific and says this only works on lists of strings or something like that. Uh, but list.append happens to be generic like that. OK. Um, and finally, we come to tags. So everything you've seen so far um, is stuff that you might find in a lot of different languages, um, like uh, Elm <laughs> especially. If you've used Elm, a lot of this is probably quite familiar. Um, Tags is, is the first feature that we're going to talk about that um, Rock does tags in a way that uh, is similar to, uh, if you've ever used OCaml, they have a feature called polymorphic variants. This is kind of similar to that, but um, I don't know of any language that does it quite the way that Rock does. So now we're getting into the sort of the first novelty territory. Um, and yet, by design, <laughs> the way it's designed is hopefully this will seem kind of familiar to something that you've used in another language. Um, and when we get to the demo, you'll see why this feature is really awesome. Um, OK, tags. So. Here is a way to define a type annotation for tags. Um, this is what's called a tag union. So what I'm saying here is I'm saying color has the type either red or green or gold. And you'll notice that all three of these are capitalized. Each of these is a tag. So red is a tag, green is a tag, gold is a tag. And this type is saying in the, in the uh, square brackets that the color value is going to be one of these three tags and nothing else. So it's basically an enumeration. If you use a language that has enums or something like that, very similar concept. It's got to be one of these three exact things. If I do anything else, it's not going to work. So for example, I could say color equals green. This will type check, because green is one of the three uh, tags in this tag union. Um, similarly, I could also say red. I could also say gold. But if I tried to say blue, that would not compile, because I said it was either red, green, or gold. But now here I am saying it's blue. Now, where this might seem a little bit different from maybe if you use like uh, enums or algebraic data types or something like that in other languages, um, is that this is all sort of specified on the fly. Remember, I said earlier that you can <laughs> you don't you never need to put a type annotation in Rock. If I wanted to, I could delete all of these type annotations and all of these would compile. So actually, even this one, like this one, would not compile with the type annotation. But if I took the type annotation off, all of these are fine. It's like hey. You want to use a tag called green? Great, that, that's fine. You want to use a tag called red? Also fine. You can just make up tag names on the fly, like completely out of nowhere, and it's fine. It'll, they'll, just, they'll just go in there, and Rock will just you know, infer, uh, based on how you're using them, like what the, uh, the, the, the set of uh, the types that are possible for that uh, tag union are. OK, so let's look at an example of like, uh, how we'd actually use one of these things. So here's a function called toStir, so like basically converting a color tag to a string. And I'm using a when expression. So you may have seen this as like other languages call it like case or match or switch or things like that. They're all kind of similar. Um, basically, I'm saying like when color is red, when the tag is red, then I want to return the string red. When the, color, when the tag is green, return uh, the string green. When the, uh, when the tag is gold, return the string gold. So basically, I'm just taking this and converting it to a string. Everything over here, this is just like, it doesn't have to be a string literal. This could be like a function call or like an entire if or you know, calling other functions or whatever I want. It's basically like whatever expression I want, I can put on this side. 
this side is, is called a pattern match. So I'm basically saying I have this pattern, and um, if it fits the pattern of it's a red tag or a green tag or a gold tag, um, then uh, take this branch or this branch or this branch. So it's a conditional much like if. Um, we're not going to get into like really advanced fancy pattern matching stuff, but um, if you've ever used Rust, Rock has uh, very similar pattern matching capabilities to, to Rust. Um, now, uh, if I were to put a type annotation on this, this is the one that I would put on there. It says, this is a tag union of either red or green or gold, and it returns a stir. Uh, so that color there has to be one of these three tags, uh, and it has to return a string. Um, but again, even if I didn't put that annotation there, the rock compiler would figure out that that has to be the type of this based on how I've implemented this. Because this when is only matching three different possibilities. It says, look, color is one of these three things. I didn't put in a, like an, a, a, you know, a default branch, like an otherwise branch, like an else branch. I just said, look, it's, it's got to be one of these three things. So the compiler says, oh, OK, well, if those are the only three possibilities, then this is a tag union with those three tags in it. If I added a fourth one in here, like blue or something like that, then the compiler would infer you know, the same thing, but comma blue in there as well. So it's all based on how you're using it. Um, you can also uh, get the compiler to infer different tag unions uh, based on conditional branches that have uh, different tags in them. So here I have an if x is greater than 0, then green, else gold. So basically, if I take this branch, then it's going to return the green tag. Otherwise, it's going to return the gold tag. So again, the compiler will say, oh, well, I see that the, the type of this color thing right here, it could be either green or gold, depending on whether x is greater than 0. So I'm going to infer that the type of this is um, uh, <laughs> green or gold. Um, so uh, there's a little star here uh, when you're inferring it in this way, um, which is fine. Uh, don't worry about that for now. Um, it's just going to be uh, it's, it's, it's a minor distinction uh, that's not really going to come up in the course of this talk. But if you ever see it like in the REPL or something like that, uh, there is an important distinction there, but it's a little bit too advanced for like an intro talk. So uh, that's on purpose, but uh, don't worry about what it means for now. So the relevant part here is like it's either green or it's gold. Cool. OK, um, so we've got our basic example of red, green, and gold. Uh, color equals gold. Cool. Um, we could also say is colorful and have that be either true or false. Um, this, you know, true or false, very common uh, thing to see in programming languages. So I could say is colorful equals true. Um, this looks an awful lot like a Boolean type. And in fact, this is exactly how Booleans work in Rock. Uh, bool is just a, uh, a built-in type. So you can actually, if I wanted to write this code, this would work. I could also just say is colorful colon bool. That would also work because bool is built in the standard library. But really, it's just a type alias for uh, true or false as a tag union. So it's just either the, the true tag or the false tag. That's it. Um, that's how bool works in Rock. That's all there is to it. Um, incidentally, this is how you define a type alias. You basically have a, uh, you know, a, a normal looking type annotation, except it happens to be capitalized. So basically, this is saying, I'm defining a new type named bool. And anywhere you see bool, this, this, uh, the, the, the bool type, what it means is, or what it sort of uh, de-sugars to, is whatever's on the other side of the colon. So uh, this is how you can define any kind of different type annotations, so you don't have to be uh, sort of reusing uh, the same type, um, or, or like writing everything out by hand all the time. Uh, it's really common, obviously, to have like type annotations, uh, uh, sorry, type aliases, not just for tag unions like this, but also for like records, you know, like really long records, like you'd have one called user, probably, something like that. OK, um, so here is uh, another important um, concept in tags, is that tags can hold on to values. Like, they don't have to just be enums. They can also, uh, or enumerations of things, they can also um, have type parameters in there, like we saw with list. And here's a really common one. This is called result. And result has two type parameters, OK and error. I, I happen to name them that. It could be also like A and B, or X and Y, or whatever. Um, and it's a tag union with two tags. One is OK and one is error. But you might notice that OK has a value inside of it, as does error. So uh, here's an example of how I would actually create one of these result values. So I would say success equals OK tag. And then it's almost like I'm calling it like a function, like OK passing this string it worked uh, as an quote unquote argument to the tag. Um, similarly, I could say, oh, there were some problems. And this is a result uh, that has, for its error type, a list of strings. And then I would say error, and then a list of strings in there. Um, the star here in this case means like nothing has been specified. So I'm basically saying like this is a result with a string, and I don't know what the error is because that doesn't come up. Like that can't come up. There is there's no possibility that the error comes up here because it's always okay. You can imagine though if this was in a conditional, we could have a result with you know both string and then maybe list of string. Like if I had an if with this as one branch and this is the other branch, then it would be a result stir and then uh, list of stir. But 
Um, when you see it sort of like one-on-one -on -one like this, where it's just like the only possibility is OK, then it's a star for the error type right here. And then over here, uh, if, it, if it's always an error, then it's a star for the OK type. OK, um, here's an example of using results, uh, sort of like results in action. Um, so I'm calling list.get, and this is basically like, OK, give me a list of some things, in this case, names, and then give me an index. So here I'm saying index2. The index is zero based, so this would be actually the third element, even though it's like the number two, because uh, list.get name zero would give me the first element. Um, this function actually returns a result, uh, because like list.get returns a result, because it's entirely possible that the index that I give it is out of bounds. Like maybe I give it, you know, it's a list of like two elements, and I say, hey, give me the third element, and it's like, I can't do that, that's out of bounds. And so here's how that pattern match looks. So I say when list.get names two is, and then first I have a, a, a pattern for OK, and I, I happen to choose the name third name here. So basically it's like, OK, if uh, this returned an OK, then great, I've actually got the, the third name in the names list, and I can now use that in my branch. So like start out append, you know, <laughs> I'm just going to add an exclamation point on the end, or you know, whatever I want to do with that. Or I have error, in this case, uh, out of bounds, which is uh, basically the, the, the error that comes back from this list. It's essentially list.get returns either an OK with the element that you asked for at that index, or it returns an error with just a single tag in it that says out of bounds that sort of makes the code a little bit more self-destructive. Um, like error, you know, it was out of bounds. So when I'm reading this code later, I can see, OK, what are, what, is, what are the two possibilities here? Oh, it's either like it worked or there was an out of bounds error. Um, so I mentioned earlier there's no try catch in rock. This is a really simple example of how you can sort of get that same level of like readability in your code um, as you would with like a try catch, uh, but without needing a separate language feature for it. And also you sort of can't forget to handle it because it's actually part of the type. Um, so here's the full type of list.get for reference. Uh, so list.get takes a list of elements. Um, then nat is actually, rock has a couple of different number types. Nat basically means natural numbers, which means uh, they start with zero. Uh, so you, you basically, um, the relevant part here is that it can't be a negative number. So I actually don't need to worry about that case. You can't pass in like a negative index or something like that. It wouldn't compile. Um, uh, so list of elements, uh, and then the index, and then it returns a result of either the element. So that would be this OK if it, um, if it, if it actually was in bounds or error out of bounds. And then again, we see that star, which I'm not going to get into now. <laughs> um, but uh, this is basically a, a pretty common type that you would see in like a rock uh, collections function signature. It's like, give me a collection, give me something that I want to do with that collection, and then I will look into that collection and see if I can find you know, what you asked for. If I can, I'll give it to you. Otherwise, I'll give you some sort of error. And usually, there's some sort of descriptive thing in here, like here's, um, here's what went wrong. Um, you might be looking at this and say, ah, I actually wish that it didn't say out of bounds here, because that's like, you know, why do I need to say that? Um, why, why, why can't it just say error and, and not tell me any information? Hang on a sec, because when we get to uh, the demos, you'll see why uh, it's actually quite nice to have these things, um, like have these sort of descriptive names as part of the type. OK. Um, last thing about uh, result is that it's very similar to something called task, uh, which is something we're going to see a lot when we're doing the demos. So result is for. Pretty, pretty much any kind of operation that can fail, like uh, looking up a, an element in a list, that can fail if you give an index that's out of bounds. Um, tasks are for representing effects that can fail. So for example, I might have an effect that can fail of like doing an HTTP request, or reading from a file, or writing to a file. All of those can fail in various different ways. If I try to read a file and the file name's invalid, that's not going to work. That's going to give me back an error. Um, if I'm doing an HTTP request and you know, the connection fails because my internet's turned off, that's, that's also going to fail. Um, writing to a file can fi fail if it's you know, like the disk is out of space, or something like that. Um, so very similar to result in terms of uh, you know, it's got an OK type and an error type, you know, th those type parameters. Um, the main difference is just that uh, task is not actually a tag union under the hood. It's what's known as an opaque type, which means we actually can't pattern match on it directly. We can't really look into it. Instead, we have different error ha handling methods, which I will show you in a second. OK, um, we have actually already seen a function that uses task. So this is the type of our, our standard out dot line that we were using for hello world and stuff like that. Basically, like takes a string, such as hello world, and then returns a task. And the task's OK type is empty record. Empty record is basically, <laughs> it's a type that is completely useless. It has no information in it. Uh, a lot of languages will call this unit and sometimes you know, do it with parentheses instead of um, curly braces. But basically, a record with no fields in it has no information in it. It cannot possibly have any information in it. So this is essentially a way of concisely saying, this is a task that does not produce any output when it succeeds. Um, in contrast, if we saw something that was like a task for reading a file, then this would probably be like task stir because it's like, oh, if the reading succeeded, I want to you know, get the contents of the file as a string. 
And then we have the error type. Again, you know, for something like reading a file, we might see something interesting in here. But standard out.line, the way that it's implemented, at least in Rock, um, uh, is basically saying, like, you know what, we assume that this can't fail. Actually, technically, writing to standard out can fail, but we're just going to silently ignore that, at least for, for this design. OK, so um, before we get into demos, I wanted to just uh, shout out something from the, the previous talk that's going to come up in the demos, which is, uh, in Rock, all I.O. primitives are defined in the platform. Now, I know I haven't talked about platforms in this talk. Uh, if you saw the, the other talk, it was like <laughs> kind of all about this concept. Um, but basically, uh, a platform, for the purposes of this talk, you can think of it as something like a framework. Um, it's just something that we are building on, uh, like, you know, like Rails or Express in, in JavaScript or something like that. Um, it's just a way to say, like, this is my sort of like foundation. It's going to expose all the things that I'm interested in for you know, whatever use case I have in mind, whether it's a server or a command line app or whatever. Um, the only difference is that uh, also I'm getting all of my I.O. primitives from there rather than the standard li library. So for example, this like standard out.line that we've been using, that's not actually part of Rock's standard library. It's part of a particular platform that I'm going to be using in this demo. So it's a, it's a distinction to be aware of. That's another sort of novel thing about Rock. And I'll talk about the implications of that a little bit later. OK. Um, the one last thing that I need to explain, because it's going to come up in the demo, <laughs> uh, is backpassing. So this has to do with those I.O. primitives that I just talked about. This is a, a, a piece of syntax sugar in Rock, and that, that is all it is. It's just syntax sugar, and I'm going to show you how, how it desugars. Um, but it actually makes uh, working with sort of chained together effects, uh, especially potentially asynchronous ones, um, really nice. I haven't seen any other language that does this, uh, but I'm a big fan of it, and I hope other languages adopt it. So uh, let's talk about how it works. OK, so first I'm going to show you like, how the syntax works, and then I'm going to sort of break down. Uh, sorry, I'm going to show you an example of the syntax, and then I'm going to break down um, like what it actually means. So here we say username. Uh, arrow pointing in the opposite direction from the arrows we've seen before, like with functions and, and with pattern matching. So username arrow await file.read username.txt. So what is this line doing? Um, on its own, this line is actually uh, not doing much uh, because it, it wouldn't be valid on its own, but we'll see the rest of it in a sec. But basically this is saying, I want to read this file, username.txt, from the, from the disk. And then uh, I want to await this, which is to say, before I continue with the program, I want to wait until that operation completes. Once that operation does complete, then I want to uh, save the result of it in this value called username. And now I want to have this in scope so I can use it later on. Now, you may recall previously I said when you're doing like definitions in Rock with equals, the order doesn't matter. You can just reshuffle all the equals all day long. And you know, however many of them there are in a row, you can just completely reorder them. It doesn't matter. With this arrow, the order does matter. Like when I say await right here, it's saying like, actually, I'm not going to proceed with anything below this until this operation completes. So in a lot of languages, you have like async await as keywords. As we're going to see in a second in Rock, it's actually not a keyword. Um, but it has a very same, uh, similar kind of uh, feel to it, which is why we chose the name await here. Um, you can chain these together. So I might say like, I'm going to wait for the file.read. That gives me a, my username. And now the next thing I want to do is I want to do an, another await on http.get foo.com slash and then string interpolation with username. So basically read the username out of this file and then go to you know, some web address that's like got that name that was in the file uh, you know, as part of the URL. And that gives me back something called user data. And then finally, I want to write that user data um, to uh, response.txt. Notice, by the way, at the end here, I did not use the arrow and await because this is sort of the last one in the chain. So like, we're not waiting for it to do something else. It's just like, hey, once we do this, we're done. That's it. <laughs> There's nothing else to it. There's nothing else to do. Um, so this is a really common pattern you'll see when doing effects in Rock, is you'll see like there's one operation at the end, and then all the ones before it are using this. This is what the, the backpassing syntax is called, the, um, the arrow going in the other direction. Uh, and those are all like awaiting you know, one, one after the other. So we'll say, do the file.read, like await for that to finish. Once that's done, do the HTTP.get using the results of the file.read. And then once that's done, do the file.write. OK. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, backpassing is just syntax sugar. It's actually nothing more. There's nothing. There's no new language keywords. There's no new language semantics here. Um, it's purely syntax sugar for things we've already seen. So let me walk you through what the, the actual sugar is going on here and what, what this actually desugars to. OK. Let's start with that read, like file.read username.txt. Um, so uh, the task.await function, this, this, uh, <laughs> depending on your background, you'll either look at this and be like, I know exactly what that is. Or you might look at this function and be like, I have no idea what that is. That's a bunch of type variables. What's going on there? Um, simply put, you can think of this as a way to chain together two tasks. It says, take this task, and then I want to run this, uh, sorry, I want to run this task, and then I want to run this callback that takes the result of that task and then returns a new task. That's it. That's what it does. It's like, 
take this task, then do a callback, and once that callback completes, that's the, the result of the task as a whole. So chaining together two tasks via a callback. So file.read username.txt, putting a task.await in there, notice that I'm, I'm actually saying task.await. So this is a function in the task module. This is not a language keyword. Um, it's just a function that happens to be named await because it's similar. I chose that name because it's so similar to the purpose that uh, await serves in other languages uh, where it is a language keyword. Um, so task.await, and then I'm passing file.read username.txt, and then I'm passing this callback that says, once the file.read is done, its output is a string. So I'm going to you know, name that string username here. So this is a, an anonymous function, like a lambda. Um, and then the body of that function is, I want to do my next task, which is http.get, foo.com, slash, and then username. So this right here, what I've highlighted, is a lambda. It's, a, it's an anonymous function. And that's what's being passed as the callback to task.await. So, Task.await says, give me a task. In this case, I'm giving you the file.read task uh, that says, you know, read username.txt. Then give me a callback that returns a second task. It says, okay, great, here's the callback. It's got, as its one argument, the result of that task. And then here's the second task that I'm returning. It's an http.get task. So do the file.read, then in the callback, do the uh, http.get. And notice that because of, you know, just how normal functions work, um, I now have in scope for this thing, uh, username as an argument, because that was the result of the file.read. And so that's how we sort of effectively chain these two tasks together. Like username is only in scope for this callback, which means that, you know, we sort of obviously we, we can't have access to this until the file.read is done. Otherwise, I mean, what would the username value even be before we'd finish the file.read? So without any syntax sugar at all, this right here, what we've seen on the page is just Plain, vanilla, ordinary rock, all the stuff we learned before backpassing. Okay, now here's the backpassing version. This right here is exactly the same code as before. Like the compiler sees these two things and it's like, that is identical. I don't see any difference between these two. Um, because uh, basically what we've done is we've taken this lambda that we wrote and we just wrote it backwards. We just flipped it around. So we have username and then an arrow pointing this way. And then here we just have the same username thing, but the arrow is just pointing the other direction. And here we have task.await and the one argument to task.await. And here we have task.await and the one argument to task.await. Um, and here we have in the body of this function with username as its argument, http.get foo.com slash username. And here's the body of this function, http.get foo.com slash username. So this is the syntax sugar in a nutshell. It's just like we're taking a, a lambda and flipping it around to the other side because it looks really nice when you're chaining effects together. <laughs> um, now again, there's nothing here that's specific to effects. Like you can use this for anything. You can <laughs> Theoretically, you can use backpassing for Every single function you ever define, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, that would look pretty weird, but, um, but you could do it. Uh, any, anytime you ever call a function anonymously like this, you can totally use backpassing for it. Um, but this is like the use case it's really designed for, and so far we haven't really seen any use cases that are like really compelling outside of this, like chaining effects together. Um, to, uh, to take it one step further, uh, previously I had task.await, but let's say that I imported that unqualified so that it's just called await in scope rather than, I have, rather than having to say task.await. Well, now we get to the version that looks sort of more like the language keyword, but again, it's the same code. I just, I just took off the task dot. Um, and you know, it's the same thing as before, like uh, username uh, lambda in either case. It's just like await is now without the task dot in front of it. And we can also take this further when we keep nesting these things together, right? Chain them together. Um, this is a common criticism of callbacks is that you get the quote pyramid of doom where like the more things you chain together in a row, you know, your indentation level keeps increasing because normally you indent when you, uh, when you add something on here. So here we have um, one big lambda of like, you know, username uh, comes out of the file.read, and then immediately what we do is we do another await with the, on the http.get, and then once we get a response from that, then we do a file.write. So it's sort of a, a lambda nested inside another lambda, right? This is like, if you ever use like uh, pre-promises Node.js, you maybe saw a lot of this, this type of stuff going on, just like the nested callbacks. And yeah, I mean, it, it was an annoyance when you were doing in that style that like you would just, your indentation level would keep increasing and eventually you'd have to like break it by like pulling some code out and you know, setting something equal to, like giving it a name or something like that. Um, but with backpassing, you don't have to do that because um, again, same exact <laughs> syntax. This is just syntax sugar for what I've written above. The indentation level doesn't increase. So here we have the first lambda that's like the, the gray one that I've highlighted up here. And then here's the blue one nested inside the gray one. So again, it is just, it's still two, you know, lambdas nested inside one another. It's just, you know, syntax sugar to make it look nicer for when you're chaining things together like this. Okay, so um, again, backpassing, just syntax sugar. Um, that's, that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, but, you know, when we're going through the demo, you're going to see it. So um, without further ado, it's demo time. We've now, we've now got all the prerequisites out of the way. All right, so um, here is a much bigger uh, <laughs> a program than what we've seen so far. 
Um, this is, it's, it all fits on you know, my screen, but uh, this is obviously like bigger than what we've seen before. So I'm just going to real quick walk through this code, and then I'm going to actually run it, and I'm going to run it a few different ways. So first line here, um, this is totally optional. I can, I can get rid of this, but uh, this is a, a shebang or hashbang or whatever you want to call it uh, syntax. Um, this is basically something that if you're on a uh, Unix-based system, so Mac OS or Linux, um, this lets you run this as a script. Um, rather than having to run it using Rock. Um, this is one of the nice things about having uh, Rock uh, you know, use comment syntax that's a, a pound like this. That's basically the reason we have pound for syntax, uh, for, for comment syntax is that according to the Rock compiler, this is just a comment, but according to Unix, this is actually more than just a comment, um, which is kind of neat. Um, Okay, this is, uh, you may, may recall, at <laughs> the very beginning of all this, I mentioned uh, there's a module header that would normally go before like main equals hello world. Um, I'm gonna explain this after we get through the demo, so just, you can kind of just ignore it for now, but just rest assured we will come back to this. Um, so now let's focus on this uh, main here. So I have now given uh, main a task type. Um, so previously I mentioned that uh, this sort of empty record is what you'll see if like you have a task that doesn't produce anything. So Main, pretty commonly, it's like, well, main's gonna do a bunch of stuff, but it's not actually gonna like produce an output like file.read would. So it is a task in the sense that it's, you know, it's a bunch of things chained together, um, but it doesn't produce anything. Um, this right here, this is actually an, uh, this, these two square braces, that is an empty tag union. So an empty record basically says, uh, this is, uh, th there's nothing, there's no info here, um, but this one is actually impossible. Uh, you can't actually have a value that is an empty tag union. Like you have to, there has to be a tag there for it to possibly be satisfied. So this is another way of saying uh, like the star type like we saw earlier. It's basically like saying, this is a task that cannot possibly have an error. I guarantee it because I'm so confident that it can't have an error that I'm gonna say it's an empty tag union. There's nothing that could possibly go in there. So this is quite a, a common type that you'll see uh, that basically means like this is a task that, uh, well, I guess it's not that common. It's very common for main um, to say like this is a task that doesn't produce anything and cannot fail. That's what these, uh, these types say right here. Okay, then uh, this may look familiar from the slides. Uh, so this right here is basically we're doing like await file.read username.txt. Sound familiar? Um, we're awaiting that, naming it username. Uh, then we're doing an HTTP.get. Um, rather than foo.com, this is actually going to localhost. I happen to have a localhost server running in the background that will actually serve us up something <laughs> uh, that, that goes into this uh, user data thing right here. And then we're gonna do a file.write with whatever we get out of that user data um, from that little uh, localhost server. All of this I have uh, assigned equal to task. So this is, you know, I mentioned previously like, you know, await, all it does is it chains two tasks together. So every time you call await, uh, with backpassing or not, you're just chaining these tasks together to produce like one bigger and bigger and bigger task. So at the end, I'm just giving this task a name. I'm just calling it task. So this is sort of the, the meat of what this is doing. And then I'm calling task.attempt, which is basically a way to turn a task into a result. Like we talked previously about how task and result are both about like okay and error, but with a task, you can't actually pattern match on it because you can't, sort of can't see its internals. Um, but with result, you can. So task.attempt is essentially like, give me a task and I'm gonna run it and then uh, tell you whether or not the result was okay or error. So basically this is a way for me to get a result version of that task because as you can imagine with file.read, http.get, file.write, there's a lot of things that can go wrong in those things. And basically then I'm doing a when result is, and now I'm just doing a pattern match on all the different possible things that can go wrong. Um, so if nothing went wrong, I'm like, great, standard out.line success, I'll print that out. Um, otherwise, if there was a file read error, like if it was not found, then I'm gonna print out not found. Uh, if it was uh, some other file read error, I'm gonna say uh, file read error. Real quick note, if you compare these two lines, you'll see one says error, file read error, not found, and then the, the path, because not found actually tells you what was I, what was I trying to read, uh, so, so you can you know, print out that in your error message. The underscore basically says, I wanna match everything else. So here I'm saying like, there was a file read error, it wasn't not found, but I'm not gonna bother enumerating all the different things that could go wrong if, if there's a file read error. I'm just gonna say like, underscore basically means like everything else. So this is just sort of like the generic, I don't know, there was some sort of file read error and I don't have any more information for you. Um, similarly, I did that for all the cases in file write error. And then I actually enumerated several different HTTP get errors. Um, so like bad UTF-8, like, oh, I was expecting a UTF-8 value. All rock strings are UTF-8, so if I get back a UTF-8 response from a server and I try to convert it into UTF-8, it doesn't work, then uh, we'll get this error. Um, but I can also just get like a 404 or a 500 error. So we can, we can special case those if we want. Um, you can use numbers in pattern matching uh, if you want, like this. You can also use string literals if you want. Um, and then finally, if we get some other status in here, it's gonna be like, okay, you know what? Uh, get returned you know, this particular error um, using stirred out from it to convert the, uh, 
the, the status integer to a string. Um, and then I'm just going to print that out. Um, worth noting that uh, I haven't shown this anywhere else, but um, you can actually have, you know, if you want, multi-line you know, expressions inside your, uh, your pattern match branches um, in, a, in a when. OK. So to recap, here's what this, this uh, function is doing. This is obviously significantly bigger than hello world, but it's still not doing that much. It's basically, we're just saying, like, read username.txt. Um, and uh, then we're going to do an HTTP.get on the result of that. Um, I'm just going to, uh, well, I'm going to run it in, in the console in a second, and then write the result to userdata.txt. So um, let's run it. So what we should see after all is said and done is it should take a second. It's going to have to like read this, then uh, uh, send that username to localhost 8000, um, and then write that to userdata.txt. OK, cool. Running it. Great. Success. So we, it said success, um, which means that it made it all the way through uh, to this path, which is a good sign. So let's see if we now see uh, um, user data.txt. It says, cool, it worked. All right, <laughs> great. Now, was that what it should have done? Um, to tell that, we can just uh, check inside this uh, username.txt. So username.txt just says RT Feldman. OK, fine. Um, now I can go into the browser. And you may recall that uh, we were looking at um, localhost port 8000 and then uh, username um, within that. So let's just go back and go to uh, localhost 8000 username. And I guess that'll download that. Uh, I didn't plan that part of the demo. Anyway, take my word for it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's giving us back uh, this, uh, the, the contents of user data, which is like, cool, it worked. I guess I could actually w get that. Let's, let's try that. I'm, I'm just tempting demo fate right here. Um, localhost. 8,000 uh, slash RT Feldman. All right, RT Feldman dot one. Cool, it worked. Okay, so great. So it actually did what we expected. Hooray. Um, okay, now worth noting that um, if I delete username, uh, sorry, user data dot txt, let me just clear that real quick. Um, I can, instead of using, uh, oops, instead of using uh, rock, calling rock, the rock compiler for this, because of that hash bang at the top, I can just say dot slash examples HTTP file, and it's going to do exactly the same thing. Uh, you know, run it, um, print out success at the end, and then uh, I can do less uh, user data.txt is back, and cool, it worked. OK, so now let's mess around with this a little bit. <laughs> so we, we've seen that the baseline version works. Um, let's look at a couple of different things that we can do here. Um, so first of all, uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to, I want to take out uh, these two. I want to just not, uh, I'm just going to comment them out. So we're not going to do the file.read username.txt. We're not going to do that. Uh, we're still going to write to user data.txt, but inside it, we're going to just put like hi, you know, something like that. Um, now, because we're doing that, uh, we can't get a file read error anymore. We can still get a file write error, but we can't get any of these HTTP errors. So this should still work. It's just that inside user data.txt, it should just say you know, hi instead of, uh, instead of all that stuff. So let's try that again. Um, Note that it gives me a warning for unused import. So it says, like, you know, HTTP is unused, like you've imported it. Um, again, we haven't gone over the module header yet, but, you know, it's basically like, all right, look, you imported this thing and you're not actually using it, so, you know, you don't need to do that. But it still ran it, it still said um, success. So let's uh, read this, and now it says hi. Great. Now let's do something interesting. Now I'm going to reintroduce uh, file.read. So I'm still, I'm, I'm doing the work here, but I'm not actually. Uh, using the result here. I'm not using username at all. I'm just reading it out of there, and let's see what happens. So I'm going to try and run it again. Unsafe pattern. This when does not cover all the possibilities. Other possibilities include error file read error. So the compiler actually detected that because I'm using a file.read in here, that uh, there are error cases that need to be handled now. So I mentioned earlier on that like rock doesn't have try catch instead it has like error unions. Um, this is basically just using the tags feature for error handling. And one of the really cool things about this is that the errors accumulate. So when I chain things together with a wait, this has to do with the star that I mentioned earlier in the, in the tag union that uh, I, I don't want to get into because it's too long to explain like what's actually going on there. But the upshot of it is this. When I chain things together with a wait, if there are error values in there, they stack up. They just keep accumulating and accumulating such that at the end, when I do this result uh, pattern match on here, it just like the compiler just knows about all the different errors that could happen. And I can just handle them all at once like this. So it said, hey, <laughs> you didn't handle error file read error. I would have to crash if I saw one of those add branches to them. By the way, you might also note that it still ran and said success. So like one of the things that is sort of an aspirational goal, we're definitely not there yet with the compiler, but we're trying to make it be the case as often as possible that compiler errors don't block you from running your program. 
Uh, what I mean by that is that um, it'll tell you about a problem like this, like if, if there is one, um, but it's not actually going to prevent you from running your application. So one of the things that's always kind of like annoyed me about uh, type check languages like Rock um, is like if I'm testing, for example, I make a bunch of changes, I get a bunch of compiler errors, I can't run any of my tests yet because I still have compiler errors. And maybe I don't want to fix all of them, I want to fix like some of them and then run some tests and fix some more and run some tests. Um, and I can't do that because it's like, well, it's, it's sort of all or nothing. Either, either the type checker passes or not. So we're really trying to sort of um, avoid that and basically as often as possible and hopefully, fingers crossed, we can get it to be like, you know, almost all the time um, that the, the, the type checker doesn't have to block you. It can just inform you, but it'll still run as far as it can. And, you know, if it, if it hits an impossible case that where it like can't do anything, then of course it'll crash just like a dynamically typed language would. Um, but that's still a work in progress. I, I wish I could demo that being like super awesome and fancy, but it's, it's, it's not there yet. Um, other thing you might notice is that uh, this time we did not get the unused import warning. So one of the things uh, that the compiler does is that um, by default, if there are any warnings, like basically things that are like completely harmless, just FYI, um, it only prints those once you've gotten through all the actual errors, like things that are gonna, like, potentially going to affect the runtime behavior, like cause a crash like this. Um, OK, so it's like, hey, you didn't handle file read error. I would have to crash if I saw one of those. Add branches for them. OK, so let's do that. I'm just going to add one, though. I'm just going to put back this one. Um, the, the not found path. So I did not handle, I only handled not found. Like if the file is not found, I'm handling that. But I'm not handling all the other cases. So let's see what happens. Once again, unsafe pattern. <laughs> and here it says, okay, okay, like uh, better. <laughs> like I, I'm glad you, you, you made some progress here. But it's like, look, there's all these other things that could go wrong and you didn't handle any of them. Um, like file busy, file was directory, illegal byte sequence, invalid seek, right? All these things. So now you can kind of see like, yeah, it's actually aware of like all the different things that can go wrong with a file read and it knows that I only handled one of those. Um, so here, th that's where we kind of get like, all right, you know what, catch all, catch all. I don't want to deal with all of those one at a time. I could if I wanted to, but for this, you know, this is a demo, so <laughs> I'm just going to handle one of them and uh, now it's going to be happy again. Um, but you will notice that now I have two warnings, right? We have the unused import still from HTTP, but also it mentions unused argument. Um, so, you know, it says that it doesn't use username like in this backpassing thing. I mentioned earlier that like the compiler is not ready for prime time. This is a bunch of bugs and like like known bugs. We have like a, you know issue tracker full of uh, you know things that are known. Um, this is one of the tamer ones, <laughs> which is that like uh, the backpassing it just always calls it like zero. Like really, we can make a better error message here, right? Instead of zero doesn't use username, we could say like hey, this like backpassing function doesn't use username, right? Instead of like instead of you really do need an argument to uh, an argument of zero, right? Um, some of the errors are like a sharper edge than this, where it's like the compiler will actually crash or something like that. Obviously, we don't want that to happen. We're like working through those. But again, I want to set expectations if you do decide to try out Rock. Um, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff like this that like we're, we're just not done with yet. It's, it's still a work in progress. Um, but hopefully, as you can also see, there's also quite a bit here. Um, cool. Um, and same thing uh, with this one. So if I put this HTTP.get back, um, once again, I'm going to uh, get, you know, get it complaining about like, okay, hang on, um, you know, unsafe pattern. Uh, you know, you, you haven't handled HTTP get errors. Um, and once again, I can, I can handle you know, some of these. Here I can actually even go further. I can handle, I'm, here I'm handling status, but I'm only handling 404. I'm not handling 500 or anything else. And it's going to know about that too. And it's, it's even going to complain like, hey, you, know, you still have some other statuses to cover here. Um, so only if I actually cover all of these different error cases, one way or another, even if it's with catch-alls, is it going to be like, okay, you're good. Oh yeah, <laughs> now I'm not using user data anymore because I changed it to hard-coded high. Whoops. Um, okay, now we're back where we started. Um, one final note on this is that because this is pattern matching, you can also put the catch-alls wherever you want. So if you want, you could also just like replace all of this with just like, ah, and just that's my error handling, right? It's like either either success or it just like blows up, and it'll accept this because like okay, I mean technically you did handle all the possibilities, you didn't do the best job of it, <laughs> uh, but you know that that did work. Um, so this this is sort of like the maximally concise version, but I mean hopefully you can see from the demo that like. I don't think we need try catch in this language. Like when we have this this feature, I like this a lot better than try catch. It's like it's more explicit. It's not a separate language feature, and I really like how the the errors just sort of like accumulate as they you know um, flow through the tasks and stuff like that. Okay, so um, this is demo number one. This is the, the CLI platform. Um, I'm going to go into demo number two in a second. This one's going to be a shorter demo. Uh, it's, it's not going to be as like conceptual and stuff like that, but it's going to be a different platform. So this platform is sort of uh, again think of platforms kind of like a framework. This one's designed for building CLIs. This next one's going to actually be designed for building a web server. So um, I'm not going to go through the code in as much depth here. Um, we're not going to mess around with it as much as the previous one. I'm really just going to kind of like show you what it's doing, and then uh, we'll try it out. 
Okay, so here, instead of a command line uh, app, we basically have something that's like, this is a web server. Um, it's gonna you know, do the usual web server stuff. We've got various different routes. Um, this is an API we just kind of, like, I, I threw this together like quite quickly and then Folkert uh, you know, messed around with it too. And, and so basically, uh, this is maybe not the final API, but uh, you can sort of get the gist of how this could work. Um, so we have like get zero, meaning like uh, I wanna do a HTTP get and there are zero arguments. So this is just like foo. Basically this would be, uh, this one right here would be slash foo and this would be slash bar. Um, this one is get one, which means there's one argument. So this is like, uh, you know, slash users, oops, slash users, slash something. And the something is like the one argument. And then that actually gets passed into this get user function, which basically takes that string as an argument. So if I said like slash users slash RT Feldman, then uh, this get user function would get called. And the username here would be um, RT Feldman. Um, and then basically all we're doing here, we have like really, really basic handlers here. Um, this is just a task that's returning a response. Uh, response, I can get, I can do like status 400 for invalid username if it's empty, or I can do response.okay, which would be a status 200. Um, and then we, uh, we can, this, since this is a task, I can either say task.succeed, which basically means like, I'm not gonna run anything, I'm just gonna be like, just, just send this response back. Or we can do all of the, you know, back passing fanciness like we saw in the, in the previous example, you know, once you've got a task, you can do as many effects as you want in there. You know, everything's totally cool. Um, these, I'm not even bothering like, uh, with uh, naming them. I just like, just, just throw the task right in there. Task.succeed, you've reached foo, you've reached bar. So basically, we have a couple of different routes here. Slash foo, slash bar, slash user, slash RT Feldman, and then this one is just um, slash users. Okay, so um, let's uh, run this real quick. So I'm just booting up the web server right here, listening for connections on port 8000. Um, I happen to have a browser tab open with uh, port 8000, uh, eight oops, wait, that's, oh, sorry, was it 8000? No, 8080, my bad. Um, yeah, so uh, if I open up the users one, it says could not read users.txt, so we'll come back to that in a sec, but I can also do foo, and it says you have reached foo, so that's basically uh, um, uh, right here, right, you have reached foo, so that was the, the foo route. Um, I can also say bar, and I'll say you have reached bar, great, uh, and, sorry, my computer's running quite slowly. <laughs> Uh, with, with Zoom and like this browser extensions and stuff. Um, and then, uh, right, so then if I say uh, uh, slash users, um, this list users function, notice that it does a, a file dot um, read on users.txt. And uh, in this directory, I don't actually have a, um, a users.txt. Uh, I have username.txt, but not a users.txt. So let's just make one of those real quick. Users.txt, let's say like RT Feldman, uh, Folkert Dev. So this is Folkert DeVries, who is pretty much entirely responsible for this demo working. <laughs> he did a ton of bug fixes and like a ton of API changes. I super appreciate it because otherwise this demo would have been like much shorter and, and much less interesting <laughs> without all the hard work he did on this. Um, so slash users, great. Now it just lists them out um, because you know, all, all, the, all the users thing is doing, all the users route is doing is just uh, reading from that file and just spitting out you know, the, the direct um, answer or a 500 error like we saw, you know, could not read users.txt um, if it can't find it. Okay, cool. One thing I want to note about uh, this demo um, is that basically all we did here is uh, the same kind of stuff that we did over here. Um, you know, I, I told you that there's a different platform under the hood. Like, uh, yes, this is this is the CLI platform. This is using the uh, the server platform. But I haven't really talked about like what does that mean? What does it mean to have a different platform? But you can kind of get the feel for this. It's like really we're just sort of writing the same kind of code. It's just like there's a different sort of framework under the hood. Is about how it feels. Um, one more platform I want to demo. Um, oh yeah, of note, uh, the CLI platform is like, it can't do a whole lot more than what I demoed here. It's like very much a work in progress. The web server one literally can't do anything more than what you see here. It's, it's like even more a work in progress. Like if you know like Return of the Jedi, there's like the second Death Star, it's like it got big holes in it, right? Like we're very much at the like still under construction phase. So you can't just like run out and be like, I'm gonna build my whole startup on this web server. Definitely not gonna work. Um, but it, like you can sort of see the pieces, right? Like there's, it's, it's, it's far enough along that like you can, you can do some stuff with it, like proof of concept, like it, it definitely works uh, in some measure. Third demo, um, again, a different platform. Um, this one, uh, I'm going to edit uh, not using Vim like I have for the other two. This one, I'm going to edit using the Rock Editor. Um, this is the Rock Editor in all of its glory right now. It's, it's very simple, um, but it has some pretty cool aspects to it. Um, so we can see we have uh, some comments up here that is just sort of explaining how the editor works. Um, we have this uh, Hello World app, uh, you know, again, the module header, which I will explain in a second, um, or, or after this demo. And then we just have main equals hello from Rock. So this is like the most hello world of all hello worlds. It's literally just a string, hello from rock. Um, why is that cool? Uh, well, because uh, this, if you may have uh, noticed carefully, I'm saying rock build dash dash backend equals wasm32. 
This is Hello World in WebAssembly. Um, so over here in my other tab, uh, Hello from Rock, great. And now let me go back and actually edit that. Um, and instead of Hello from Rock, let's say, uh, I don't know, Hello Philly. And save that. And rebuild it. And now, Hello Philly, great. So we've now actually used the Rock editor in all of its you know, uh, <laughs> glory so far. It's, it's, not, it's not like super amazing, but uh, huge shout out to Anton and, and uh, Lucas, for, uh, Lucas Rosa for uh, all the work they've done like getting this editor working because um, what's, what's maybe you can't tell about this is that uh, this is not actually a text editor. Um, this is a like, it's very rock specific and it's actually like what I'm editing right here is actually not individual text characters, but rather um, like this is completely aware of like the, the rock, like AST and the syntax and all that cool stuff. I'll demo a little bit more of that in a second. Um, but just to prove that we're actually like running something in WebAssembly and not just like spitting this string out, um, I will do like uh, greeting equals and then I don't know, uh, sure, I'll do it like that. Um, and this one I'll just make like hi and greeting. So using the same kind of string interpolation that we've talked about before. Um, so this is actually like now it, it actually needs to do something at runtime, which is just like, you know, uh, <laughs> interpolate that one thing in there. So again, very basic, but, um, but it actually is like we're really like running WebAssembly in the browser um, uh, from Rock. So this is another thing you can use Rock for. This is like the, even the earliest, earliest days of this. So uh, big shout out to, um, to Brian, Carol, and, uh, and Folker DeVries for like um, putting together like all, all the, like collaborating to come up with uh, how this works. Like this particular um, backend is like only about a week old. <laughs> you couldn't do WebAssembly like two weeks ago. Maybe it was like three weeks ago. I don't know. It's, it's very, very new. Um, but hey, it works. Um, and, uh, and that's pretty cool. Um, so some other stuff I want to I show off about the editor, again, even in its like very early stages, I can, I can um, and I, I've demoed this in other places, but I still think it's really cool, is I can um, like notice if I, if I open a record here, um, it immediately like closes the record for me and then like puts the caret in the middle. Um, I can see like foo colon and then it's like, okay, I'm going to put a blank here because there, there has to be something after that foo thing. Um, I can put another record in here like bar and then inside of here I can have like a list of strings that's like, you know, blah. Um, and the, the, one of the, uh, the cool things about this so far is again, I mentioned that like rock has complete type inference, like it knows the types of everything. The editor does too. Um, so if I highlight this, it can actually tell me like, okay, this is a string. That's not very impressive. Any editor could tell you like a string literal is a string. But if I uh, do com uh, control shift up um, or command shift up on a Mac, it does like an expression wise expansion. So it's actually expanding to the enclosing expression. So now it's like, oh, this is a list of strings. And actually this is a record with a field named bar and the type of that field is list of strings. And then one more, you know, a record, foo, bar, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, this is not, this editor is like definitely not ready for use as a daily driver, um, but the goal is to make it so that it's like not only useful as a daily driver, but like um, just, just a really, really, really nice high quality experience where like we're using this really tight integration between the compiler and the editor to give uh, hopefully a really ambitious like experience, the likes of which no one has ever seen. I'm not really going to talk about that in this talk. Um, I've talked about that elsewhere, like some of our specific ambitions for the editor, um, but this is sort of a demo of like what we got so far. Like you can actually use it to edit files now, but when I gave the talk uh, at, in ATE, you could not like actually save files yet. Because um, remember, this is editing in AST. So when it actually saves it to disk, it actually has to basically like, run a formatter on this um, to, to save it out as a text file. Because as you've seen with the other examples, I'm editing them in Vim. Like it's, it's got to work in both. Um, OK, um, cool. So uh, those are our three demos. We have uh, uh, command line, server, and WebAssembly. And now finally, I'm just going to sort of uh, close things out by, um, by talking about, uh, as promised, the uh, the, uh, the module header syntax and sort of like what that means and, and just kind of like get back to um, uh, platforms a little bit and we'll, uh, then we'll wrap up with some questions. Okay, so um, this was like the, the hello world uh, with, with actually with the module header. Um, this is like what I, I omitted at the very beginning of the talk when I was just um, going through the, uh, uh, the sort of the, <laughs> the interesting part of that. Um, so let's just talk through this a little bit. So first thing that says app hello world. So at the beginning of each rock module, we basically talk about what type of module it is. So App module is basically like, this is sort of the root of the application. This is the thing that you're actually running. We also have interface modules, which are basically just like things that you're importing from other modules, like, you know, just for code sharing and that type of stuff. Um, this string is the name of the binary that Rock is going to compile. So uh, Rock, much like Go or Rust or something like that, um, it doesn't have a, like a VM or anything like that. It just compiles to a plain old binary executable. Uh, old school style. Uh, so there's nothing to install. Like if you want to compile this application and give it to someone, um, it does have to be uh, uh, OS specific. Like you have to compile it for you know Windows or for Mac OS or whatever. But you give it to them, and they can just run it. Like they don't need to you know install something for it. It's just like here you go, here it is. Uh, or WebAssembly, for example. So this just tells like what's the name of the binary that the compiler is going to uh, spit out. Um, 
packages. So this is uh, sort of, right now we're sort of future-proofing this. Obviously in the future, like Rocks, the, the plan is to have a package manager. We don't have one yet. Um, but uh, when we do have one, that's where you're going to get these platforms from. So we've designed it so far like in anticipation of that, even though it doesn't exist yet. Um, uh, I'll explain what PF is in a second, but basically this is like a string that says, where can I find the code for this platform? So in this case, I'm saying like, this is on my hard drive at example platform slash CLI. In the future, when we have a package manager, the plan is to support a syntax where you don't have the quotes and it's actually referring to a package like from a package repository. So you can just install it right there and then put a version number on it. Like, cool, I'll just go get the package, uh, the platform from uh, the package repo. Um, Imports, uh, so here I've said pf.standardout, and so that's where these two are sort of connected. Um, basically, uh, in case there are multiple packages that have the same module name, so standard out, unlikely, but you might imagine multiple different packages having a module called event, for example. This is how you disambiguate, is basically you specify when you're defining the package, you give it what I call a short name. So it doesn't have to be short, you could name it as long as you want, but here I've named pf short for platform. Um, and then whenever you're referring to it in the imports, you qualify it with that short name. So I say pf.standardout, and it's super clear where this is coming from. It's coming from the, the, um, the, the pf uh, uh, platform, or the, or the package. So if I had other packages in here, I would also give them names. Um, one other nice thing about this is that a problem I've had with uh, <laughs> languages that have you know, uh, unqualified modules like this is if I have a super long list of these, I have like you know, 30 imports, like 30 different modules, and I'm trying to figure out where one of them came from, I'm like, well, I have this module called event. I know it comes from one of my packages. I have no idea which package. How do I figure that out? This is a really quick way to figure that out. It's like, oh, it's like pf.event. Great, I'll go look up what is pf. Oh, it's this. Okay, now I know. Um, so that's what that does. Um, and then finally, the last line of this, it says provides main to pf. And basically, this is how you connect sort of your application to its platform. Every platform has some sort of thing that it requires. Like it might be main, it might be something else. Um, for command line app, it's, it's just like, give me something called main, which is just a task that I'm going to run uh, when the application starts up. And the 2PF is basically saying like, hey, this is my, this is my platform package. Because you could have multiple different packages. You know, um, it's saying, that one is my platform. And then finally, uh, this is where main is actually defined. Um, Cool. Oh yeah, uh, one other thing is that um, when I do imports pf.standard out, I don't need to put the pf everywhere because I've imported it. I'm now saying like, okay, in this scope, um, the only module that I have is standard out. So like we're good. Um, I don't need to call it pf all the time. Uh, I can just say in, in the actual application itself or in, in the module itself, I can just say standard out dot whatever. Um, uh, real quick, here's contrasting this with the web server platform. So uh, again, same syntax for the first line, app hello world versus app my server, whatever I want to call the binary. Um, I would have a different a platform here, I would say like example platform slash web server instead of CLI. Um, I would have potentially different uh, imports. Um, this is an example of how you can import other things unqualified. So if the route module exposes a type called handler and a function called get zero and get one, I can import them unqualified like this. So I don't have to say route.get zero, route.get one, route.handler. I can just use them, you know, unqualified in my module. Um, and then, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, and then finally uh, here, the, the CLI wants something called main. Uh, but the web server platform wants something called run handlers. So that's why uh, for the CLI, we had something called main, but for the web server one, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, but instead of main, we had something called run handlers and it, and it has a different type. It takes a URL and you know, uh, returns a list of handlers rather than uh, a task. So um, platforms can specify like whatever they want here. Um, this is like a list. They can even say, I, I need multiple things. I need like, maybe I need something called init and something called you know, handle or whatever else. Um, so it's sort of up to the platform author what they want to require. And then as the application author, you're just like, here you go, here it is. Now I'll run my stuff. Okay, so um, just gonna wrap up with just a quick summary of like current progress on the language. Um, as you've seen, like, you know, some stuff is working, some stuff is like various, uh, you know, there's plenty of gaps. So compiling obviously works end to end. You can build a fully running application off of a platform. Um, there are some known bugs. I showed you one of them, but believe me, there are plenty that I was intentionally demoing around <laughs> because I know there's plenty of ways to like crash the compiler and get it to give like, you know, unhelpful output and stuff like that. Like I said, we got an issue tracker, we're working through it, but you know, that's, I just wanna set clear expectations. Like this is not ready for prime time. Um, standard library is partially complete. Um, you know, all the functions I used are like actually implemented, but like it's not fleshed out yet. Like there's, there's also a lot of things, like we have a long list of like, oh yeah, we still need to add these. Um, documentation, extremely minimal right now. Um, like standard library functions have some documentation, but I haven't like sat down and written like, here's a tutorial. Actually what you just saw is like the most, <laughs> the closest I've come to like explaining to someone from scratch how to use Rock. Um, 
Editor is not yet usable as daily driver, as I mentioned. Like you know, you, you can do like saving and loading now, which is awesome. But you know, there's there's still a lot more uh, there um, yet to do. Um, also, there's like s several things that we haven't started yet, like testing. We want to build that into the compiler, so you can just say like rock test, you know, whatever to run your tests. Um, packages, like we mentioned, not there yet. Um, various other like language features and stuff that we want to add, but you know, um, just haven't yet. Um, Goals, uh, hopefully, um, <laughs> eventually we will live up to Elm's ergonomic standards. As I mentioned earlier, like Rock is a direct descendant of the Elm programming language. If you haven't checked out Elm, I highly recommend it. I'm a big fan. I'm such a big fan that I made a language like descended from it. <laughs> um, Elm is like all in the browser and like compiles to JavaScript and makes like really small executables. Um, Rock, I guess you can do browser WASM stuff, but I that has a whole different set of trade-offs. Uh, so I, I would not recommend just being like, oh, it'll, this, this is great. I can, I can throw out React and just use Rock. Uh, not true. <laughs> um, if you want to throw out React, go use Elm. Um, uh, large code bases should be really easy to change. Like Elm has really good ergonomic standards. It's like, in my mind, like the gold standard. Like of all languages I've ever used, Elm has the nicest ergonomics, like by a lot. Um, and also, like it's the easiest to refactor and like make big changes to big code bases, like uh, like we do at work. Um, and I want the same to be true for Rock. Um, hopefully, the editor is so nice that I want to use it for Rock instead of Vim. Like I personally will want that. Um, as you can tell, like I'm a Vim user. I use uh, Vim for all sorts of stuff. But I think that by making the editor designed specifically for the language, like it is possible to, to, to sort of break the inertia of like, you know, familiarity with my own, you know, the, my editor of choice um, to, to make an experience that's just better than what's possible uh, in, a, in a sort of general purpose editor like Vim or uh, VS Code or anything like that. Um, and again, I talked about that more specifically in, uh, in other talks. Um, and finally, uh, fast runtime performance and fast compile times. Um, uh, you may have noticed that like I was running Rocked in like uh, script mode. It did take a second to compile. Part of that is because um, like right now, the compiler is just not as fast as we want it to be. We have an in-progress project uh, that Brendan Hansconnect has been working on that is awesome. Um, and I want to just like give you a quick uh, graph of, of what that's going to look like. Um, so this is time to build and run Hello World. So like, let's say you did want to use Rock as like a scripting language, which I think is a totally reasonable use case for it. Um, what, how long would it take to run Hello World? Because Hello World, A, this is the only thing that we've gotten working in this new <laughs> system. Uh, but B, um, that's sort of the baseline, right? You can't have a script that runs any faster than Hello World because it's like it's so minimal. Um, so I, I made a graph of like I tried this in Hello World in a couple of different systems. Um, the slowest was C++. Took almost 300 milliseconds to run Hello World, like to compile and run Hello World. Um, cat was the fastest, like the Unix utility cat, because uh, it's basically just like, hey, hello.txt, got it, spit it out to the stream. So cat took about one millisecond. C++ took almost 300 milliseconds. Um, Rust took like uh, a little bit faster than C++, but not much. Um, Go was significantly faster, about like half what C++ took. Um, Clang uh, compiling just C was even faster than that, like significantly faster. Now we're down to the like like 40 milliseconds territory. Um, Node.js was a little faster than that, it was about 35 milliseconds. Rock was even faster than Node.js with this new system, which is not what I was running off today because this is like super not feature complete yet. But um, it is feature complete enough for Hello World, but that's that's about it <laughs> at the moment. Um, and then uh, Python was even faster than Rock, um, and uh, actually Perl was even faster than Python like by a lot. But um, yeah, so basically, like this is sort of where we want to be. Is we want to like first of all, we we explicitly have a goal of catching up to Python. Like that's 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 our we like, we want to be faster than Python if we can. Um, so you know, <laughs> more work to get there. But um, but basically, like we want it to be fast enough that this this is a viable use case for Rock. Is like as a scripting language, where it's just like yeah, I just like want to run these things off the hard drive and just like just run my script. Um, so yeah, uh, Rock does have like a permissive license, um, but it is still in a private repo for now because it's still early days. I'm like just really not ready to have it like get like you know on Hacker News or something like that. It's just like uh, if you're interested, like just email me um, at this email address rock at rtfeldman.com, and I'll just give you access to the repo. Um, so I'm just really kind of trying to like sort of rate limit its growth while it's still in the early days because it's like we've got enough bugs already, <laughs> like more more bugs than we know how to deal with. Um, I really don't want to like open the floodgates until we're sort of like uh, really ready. So um, yeah. Uh, that's where we are. Thanks so much for uh, for sticking with me. I really appreciate everybody uh, <laughs> tuning in. I, I, thanks for all the claps and everything. Um, yeah, really excited. And yeah, if, if you want to um, try out Rock or uh, or get involved in the development in any, in any way, just uh, send me an email at the the email I mentioned uh, that whatever slide that was. Yeah. Thanks so much.